Welcome to Respiratory System Development Part 2, Building the Respiratory Unit. In Part 1, I covered the development of the conducting zone. Now, during lung development, there has to be a transition from placental gas exchange to autonomous gas exchange. The adaptive changes that need to occur are first, the epithelium has to have the ability to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. Second, surfactant has to be produced. And third, we have to establish parallel pulmonary and systemic circulations. In this video, I'll talk about the first two changes. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the histology wizard. To remind you, there are two major developmental processes that I've talked about that are required to complete lung formation. Building the tree or the conducting zone involves a process called branching morphogenesis, while alveolar differentiation, formation of the respiratory zone, involves the formation of a specialized unit for gas exchange. In this video, I'll focus on alveolar development and maturation of the lungs. Now, if we look at our timeline, by 16 to 17 weeks, all the major elements of the lungs have formed, except those involved with gas exchange. It's important to note here that by this point, respiration is not yet possible, so fetuses born during this period are unable to survive. We're going to start today between 17 and 24 weeks, where respiratory bronchioles are forming, and then the alveoli will begin to develop and mature, a process that can take up to eight years to complete. Now, as I discussed in part one, lung development can be divided into five morphological stages. Now, you may see slight differences in the time frames for each stage and differing transition times from one stage to another than I have listed here, and that depends on your source. Now, this is due in part to the fact that lung development is not completely synchronous, but as long as you know these rough times, you'll be fine. So far, we've completed the embryonic and the pseudoglandular stages, and we are partway into the canalicular stage. We've formed the trachea, two lungs, five lobes, and numerous segments. We formed the pleura and the pleural cavity. Now we need to form more respiratory bronchioles, form terminal sacs and primordial alveoli, and then mature those primordial alveoli into mature alveoli capable of gas exchange. So here you see those five stages with cartoons of what the epithelium looks like at each stage. These stages are histological based stages as the lungs transition from basically exocrine organs to organs that can perform gas exchange. Now as we move down that respiratory tree, the epithelium will thin out and cells in the epithelium will change from cells that help move, moisten, and clean the inspired air to the cells involved in gas exchange. I'm going to talk here about some of these cells but to learn more about their functions, check out my respiratory histology videos. Now I'm going to talk about what happens in each one of these stages and focus on what's going on with the specific airways in terms of cellular development and histology. So let's start with that pseudoglandular stage. Now the major events that occur during this stage are formation of the conducting airways, all the way up to those terminal bronchioles. In this cartoon, you can see that the epithelium has epithelial cells that are still mostly columnar. And here's a cartoon showing a terminal bronchial surrounded by connective tissue. And you can also see numerous capillaries that have formed via angiogenesis, but importantly, they're not yet in contact with the respiratory epithelium. So the lung during this stage cannot perform gas exchange. Next, we have the canalicular stage. This stage overlaps the pseudoglandular stage because the cranial parts of the lung mature faster than the caudal ones, a theme that we see repeated over and over again during embryonic development. This stage also overlaps the terminal sac or the saccular stage seen to the right. Now the first thing to note is that the lumina of the bronchi and the terminal bronchioles is going to enlarge during this stage, and the terminal bronchioles will begin to branch, forming respiratory bronchioles. By 24 weeks, each terminal bronchial will have at least two respiratory bronchioles, and each of those will then form three to six passages called primordial alveolar ducts. Now, at this point, the lung is highly vascular. And by 26 weeks, some thin-walled primordial alveoli, or terminal sacs, will begin to form. And some of the cells that perform gas exchange have begun to form, the type 1 pneumocytes, 
along with type 2 pneumocytes that will produce surfactant. Now in this section from the canalicular stage, you can see a terminal bronchial with its relatively cuboidal epithelium, numerous respiratory bronchioles. If we increase the magnification, you can see an alveolar duct with a thinner epithelium, and now you can start to see some capillaries. And if we look right at the end of this stage, overlapping into that terminal sac stage, you can much better appreciate the capillaries that are closely opposed to that thinner epithelium of the terminal sac. Now if a fetus is born at the end of this period, 26 weeks, they may survive if given intensive care because some of these terminal sacs have formed already. But most of the time, however, the premature neonates don't survive because the alveolar surface area is still pretty insufficient at this stage and the lung vascularity is still underdeveloped. Now let's move on to the terminal sac or saccular stage. During this stage, we see that many more air spaces are becoming subdivided to form terminal sacs, or saccules, hence the name. These saccules are increasingly lined by flattened epithelium that's composed of type 1 pneumocytes and type 2 pneumocytes that will produce surfactant. Now capillaries are beginning to bulge into these sacs, and you can see that in this histological image. Now it's this contact between the type 1 pneumocytes and the endothelial cells of those capillaries that establishes the blood-air barrier, permitting adequate gas exchange for survival of the fetus if it's born prematurely. Now again, you can check out my respiratory histology videos where I talk about the blood-air barrier. For now, I want to talk more about surfactant, which is produced by the type 2 pneumocyte. So surfactant forms as a film over the internal walls of the alveolar sacs, and it's important because it counteracts surface tension forces at the air alveolar surface, and this prevents atelectasis, which means collapse of the sacs during exhalation. We don't want this. So type 2 cells, like the one seen here in this histological image, start to produce surfactant at about 20 to 22 weeks in that canalicular stage, but production is really ramping up during the terminal sac stages since there's now increasing numbers of both sacs and type 2 cells. And in addition, the pulmonary vasculature is now becoming more developed. It's mainly the development of the vasculature and the production of surfactant that's critical to the survival and neurodevelopmental outcome of premature infants. Unfortunately, infants who are premature may suffer respiratory distress because of surfactant insufficiency. And this is called hyaline membrane disease and it used to be known as respiratory distress syndrome. So surfactant deficiency can be the result of a number of different things. It can be the result of mutations in surfactant production genes. It can be the result of injury in utero to the type 2 pneumocytes, or it can even be caused by sepsis or pneumonia that inactivates surfactant in full-term infants. But whatever the cause, this deficiency results in increased alveolar surface tension with subsequent resistance to inflation, and so the alveoli collapse at the end of expiration. In this process, the alveoli become injured, presumably as a result of shear stresses on the alveolar walls. You can almost think about a collapsed balloon here that you can't inflate, but if you put that stuff in the balloon that they do when they, when they blow up your balloons for parades and things, that is like surfactant, which allows those, those alveoli to expand. Now here, you see two images. First, this is just a normal lung with normal alveoli, and you can see the very thin walls or septae. And the second shows a lung from a neonate who has hyaline membrane disease. The alveolar damage causes the accumulation of cytoplasm, nucleoplasm of a lot of dead cells, plasma, transudate, amniotic fluid, other cell types. And in the lung, this looks like thick, pink, shiny material. These are the hyaline membranes. Now we know that the production of surfactant can vary among fetuses, but it does increase during the terminal stages of pregnancy, especially in those last two weeks. And it's not produced in sufficient amounts until about 34 weeks. It can, however, be stimulated by glucocorticoids given to the mother pre-birth or, or to the neonate post-birth. And synthetic surfactant can also be used as therapy postnatally.
Now our final stage of lung development is the alveolar stage. And exactly when this stage begins depends a little bit on the definition of alveolus, but essentially at 32 weeks, we have primordial alveoli present. Now seen in these cartoons, the epithelial lining is very thin with a predominance of squamous type one pneumocytes. By 37 to 38 weeks, the alveocapillary membrane or respiratory membrane is developed enough to allow gas exchange. Now the lungs don't actually function until birth, but they are capable of respiration at this point. Even so, most alveoli are going to mature postnatally. So there's about 150 million primordial alveoli in a full-term neonate, which actually sounds to me like quite a lot. But that number is going to expand to 300 million mature alveoli between three and eight years of age. Now let's dig into the development of alveoli for just a quick minute. In this first cartoon, we're roughly in that terminal sac stage where the epithelium is still mostly cuboidal, but we see the capillaries beginning to bulge into the respiratory bronchioles and terminal sacs. Now, as the epithelial lining starts to thin to that squamous layer, the adjacent capillaries will now make contact with the cells in the alveolar sacs. And a mature alveolus will have epithelium composed of type 1 pneumocytes that now have formed the blood air barrier with capillary endothelial cells and type 2 pneumocytes that are now producing surfactant. These primordial alveoli will enlarge as the lungs expand and more primordial alveoli will be formed. And this essentially happens by the formation of more septate or walls between existing alveoli. And the end result is that this greatly increases the surface area. Now let's recap. So we formed the trachea, we formed the two lungs, we formed five lobes and numerous segments, the pleura and the pleural cavity have formed, we've set up the patterning of the adult lungs. Now, the gas exchange unit has been built and surfactant is being produced. The lungs, of course, will continue to develop postnatally, but at this point, they're capable of intaking air and performing gas exchange. But there are a couple of other factors or outside factors that are critical for lung development. We touched on this during gastrulation and body folding, but if there isn't enough space in the thoracic cavity, the lungs can't develop. So if there isn't enough space, such as in this case of congenital diaphragmatic hernia seen here in this cartoon, the result is pulmonary hypoplasia. The second factor that's important are fetal breathing movements. And the third is adequate volume of amniotic fluid. And I want to very briefly talk about these two. So first, fetal breathing movements are necessary to provide sufficient force to cause aspiration of amniotic fluid into the lungs and then to stimulate lung development by creating a pressure gradient between the lungs and the amniotic fluid. Fetal breathing movements are decreased with hypoxia, smoking, narcotics, and even during labor. Now at birth, our lungs are half filled with fluid from the lungs, from tracheal glands, and mostly from amniotic fluid. So amniotic fluid protects the fetus physically, it protects it from infection, and protects the umbilical cord from compression. It serves as a major reservoir of fluid and nutrients coming from the mother and provides fluid, space, and growth factors for normal development and for normal growth of fetal organs, including the lungs. Now, during late gestation, amniotic fluid is largely produced by fetal urine and lung secretions. And so inadequate amniotic fluid levels are largely caused by defects in kidney and urinary development that affect urine output but they can also be caused by defects in swallowing. So for example, esophageal atresia or tracheal agenesis can cause a decrease in amniotic fluid levels. Poorly controlled maternal diabetes decreases amniotic fluid levels for reasons that are not completely understood. In addition, placental problems or leaking or ruptured membranes can alter amniotic fluid levels. Now that's it for development of the respiratory system. Don't forget to check out part one to learn what happens in the first 16 weeks of development and how we build the tree. Thanks for stopping by.